as an international student, I've been having a hard time finding a job here because I've been to industrial round table, granite curry fair, and I noticed that there's not a lot of uh, company that recruit international students. So when they ask us the question, golden question, do you have authorization to work in the United States? We would like to say yes, So, but it's not a firm yes. I would have to say yes, but if you offer me the job, then my university can grant me this thing, which then I have to go into that whole explanation, and but by the time, they may or may not like me, you know. I'm a junior right now from Princeton School of Management, and I'm looking for an internship actively from uh, the past two semesters, and I found out that there is one problem with CTO, is that it's not the CTO's problem, and I mean, it's, it's definitely something that CTO could improve, because uh, most of the recruiters that are, that, that are coming on campus, they don't really know about the LPT and CPT stuff, and for uh, international students who are looking for an internship, internship, they'll be falling into the difficulties of uh, getting recruiters excited about their resumes, or like uh, getting an interview on campus, because because they don't know that international students don't need work authorization to work in for an internship, but they reject students by using that kind of, uh, I would say, like excuses. So I want to know, is there anything that CCO could do to improve this kind of situation? We have a lot of conversations with many employers, um, and we are advocating on your behalf. We want companies to essentially be open to working with you, understanding that you have OPT or CPT and you are able uh, to work with them. Um, the decision to do that rests with them. We can advocate, we can ask them to do this. And I can tell you that there are students who have been successful. It is very difficult. You don't need to hear that from me. A lot of you know that from your first-hand experience. It's tough, but there are cases where students have been successful, and in part, one of the things we really try to do in the CCO is to uh, work with companies to keep them coming back to campus. We have, at my last count, about 1,300 unique companies. Probably the only Malaysian in PMO. Oh, yeah. Um, do you fit in well? Yeah, yeah. Because I, the choir that I joined um, is Heart and Soul, and they're very diverse. So we have a lot of uh, different ethnic backgrounds who are, that are in my choir. So we fit in very, very well. So we're like a family there, and in this small choir, and then when we go to like the bigger group, it, it kind of helps us to make more friends when you have like a, a bag. I, I, I think like what he said, like if you really can mingle well with those kind of people, although they are in different country, but if you really find the similarities that you guys share, then you guys can click very well. Mm -hmm. I'm actually friends with some. People they are way older than I am, and some of them similar age. So I think if you really find the similarities in the person, I think you can just click. So I feel welcome. There's no problem being like I'm the only person like different from other person now. So I noticed that if you want to like mix and blend in into like the American culture, you need to hold a position that will make it easier for you to blend in the. Oh, yeah. Culture. Number one, I think create more awareness of um, opportunities that Purdue has to, to international students. Purdue has a lot of programs, a lot of leadership programs, a lot of diversity talks, and you know, a lot of stuff like that. And I think it does not reach international students' ears, for sure, because had I not joined or be active in organizations, we would, I would not know of things like that. For example, the three of us over the weekend, last weekend, attended the Motorboard Leadership Conference. Had we not been part of any organization, we would not have known of such opportunity. And I can, I can imagine that a lot of international students would have been able to benefit from talks that they had. Same with EMB. One issue EMB has is, is that it's a sophomore leadership conference, right? And like we talked about, most of us Malaysians who come from a prep school come in as already junior or sophomore. That means they passed the credit standing. So they're not able to go to attend EMB because no one else, they, they, it doesn't show up in their system and no one else can nominate them. I'm hopeful some of the initiatives will be approved. One of them is uh, geared toward helping students uh, with primarily conversational English. Uh, a, a proposed 
you could call it a summer English camp before school begins, maybe a three week period of time. BGRI and the what we call global partners, where we bring faculty or staff overseas and we happen to also do the pre-departure orientation in China because China has been the destination of choice the last two years. Those programs are uh, non-recurring money. That means if I have enough money or my <coughs> boss, the pro office of the provost, Provost Sands has enough money, we can do it. But we're hoping that those two initiatives will also be funded with recurring money. That means we have the money every year. We have a brand new dining director who joined us last, I guess right when school started. So he has just hit the ground running. And he has an advisory committee that, um, that helps with just, you know, looking at a lot of different options in terms of what people want out of their board plans. As well as um, he started a, a vegetarian vegan advisory committee, so we had never had such a, such a thing before. Um, he happens to be vegetarian, so he's definitely on the lookout for uh, vegetarian <laughs> options across the board. So he's, he's really committed to, um, to, to helping the student experience through the dining program. I mean, when you think about it, one of the major cultural elements in terms of what brings people together is food. And so if we, we can use that food that we provide to help build those connections, we're all for that. Recently, we've heard a lot about the distinction between a, right, a racist and bias incident, um, not only in international student affairs, but also in the credit affairs and, um, and whatnot. I know that the level of damage considered, like permanent damage to public property, is a consideration when we're making that distinction, but I mean, I think it's important that we also make that distinction. I mean, what do you think about when we make the distinction of the damage done to the people when, that are affected? Um, and what is your response to when people say to just ignore it? Because we've actually heard that from the administration before, such as, um, like in the Twitter accounts, um, we've been told to just ignore it and that they'll go away because the administration can actually do much about it because of, I think, Twitter's policies or whatnot. So uh, I don't think we should ever ignore hate and bias, period. We need to shine a light on it. So I think that's why it's important to um, report all incidents so we can get a feel for and, and have some data that shows what's really going on and how people are feeling on campus. So I found out that if, although there are lots of international students, especially for Chinese students in Purdue, but like you said, they have a hard time getting involved in real American college life. Let me tell you what I know, and then maybe we'll talk about the Asian culture center. I understand conversations have been taking place to look at that. Do you understand it that way? Yeah, I was invited to one. There are a lot of students both Asian students and non-Asian students who have been promoting this. It came up last this past summer at the uh, Purdue Student Government Retreat as, a, as an issue and an initiative. It has come up, I think, on different <clears throat> in different platforms throughout the year. So I know there's serious consideration. I know Dr. Taylor has been looking at that. She's the Vice Provost for Diversity and Inclusion. So I know they've been having conversations and discussions. I just don't know where those things are, where they are, where they are right now. But I, I know that the, the leadership team of, I believe the committee you're referring, has, has met with key leaders of Purdue. I, I don't know where they are. I know they were to look, they were working very closely to, to have even, I think, the board of trustees to look at their plans, which is, you know, the top, top level. I engaged into several ISAs. Uh, events in my freshman year and sophomore year as well. But what I found is that uh, most of the participants, they are Chinese. So like ISIS um, events, they pretend to, uh, no, not pretend, they intend to like build more connection for international students to American students, but actually at the end, international students make friends with international students. Does that make sense? So like I found that it's not that efficient for Chinese students to really engage in the life in America. Most, if not all, of the international students and scholars ISS programs are for international students, so that's why you're going to see international students there. And many of them are first come, first served, and I think Chinese students are very quick to sign up. 
you know, if it's an email sent out, they're on. <laughs> and it's, you know, we have to be fair. I mean, I can't send it to, to African students first or Latin American students first, and then the Chinese. I mean, you'd all be knocking on my door if I did that. So there are a few programs that we do have. Uh, we try to mix and match with uh, U.S. students internationally. And uh, it's a very small program. It's called Business Mentors. It's for students in Cranham, where an American student and an international student are paired in a uh, partnership to work with a, not work with, but to learn from a CEO of a local company. It's a very unique program at very small scale. Another way to learn about American culture, to feel like a part of it, is when students first arrive, we have an opportunity to sign up for the International Friendship Program. And over the years, we've matched thousands of students with local people, meaning community residents, married, unmarried, married with children, married wishing they didn't have children, all kinds of people. <laughs> and um, so students become a part of a family's life. They don't live there. The family doesn't give them legal advice. They don't give them money. They don't give them housing. But they're friends, and they do things together. So that's, that's a program that's been very welcomed by many students.